Hey, I'm Dr. Rob, and this is Biblical Genetics. I'm coming to you today from the shore of the Nile River in beautiful Luxor, Egypt. I'm actually in the middle of a third 10-day tour of this wonderful country. Creation Ministries International has been taking groups of people, about 100 at a time, on a biblical tour of this country. We've been looking at uh, interesting sites and experiencing the food and the amazingly hot weather and the wonderful people and looking and trying to see all the places where the Bible references this country and how Egyptian history and biblical history actually align very nicely and beautifully and actually easily. So who's the Pharaoh of the Exodus? Who's the Pharaoh of Joseph? You know, when did Abraham come here? All those sorts of questions we're answering for our people. It's been exciting, it's been amazing, but this is not a show on archeology span or history. It's a show on genetics. And I'm gonna spend some time talking about ancient DNA and what is revealed about the history of this country. I'd like to start off with an illustration of something that was happening a little more than 10 years ago in the field of archaeology. There was almost a war happening. The journal Nature described this in a paper called The Curse of the Pharaoh's DNA. They were talking about the fact that archaeology had broken up into two very different camps and it got to the point where they weren't even attending each other's meetings. They weren't talking to each other. It was the camp that said, hey, we can pull DNA out of mummies. And the other camp that said, no, you can't. They said, DNA can't possibly last for more than 600 years. They said that DNA uh, breaks down so quickly that, and, and it's gonna be contaminated. Anyone who's ever handled the mummy is gonna add their DNA to it. And what you're probably pulling up is just uh, DNA from modern archeologists and the grave diggers and the grave robbers and, and anyone who's handled or touched or any, come anywhere close to this mummy is gonna have a lot of DNA added to it and therefore you're not gonna pull ancient DNA out. Then you had the other camp. They said, no, we can do this because first of all, when we sequence DNA out of a female mummy, we don't find any Y chromosomes. Second, we often find things like malaria DNA inside the mummies and therefore, uh, it, you know, modern archaeologists don't necessarily have malaria. This is not contamination. One issue though was when King Tut's DNA was finally deciphered, he had my Y chromosome, R1B, which is very common in Western Europeans. And since most of the archaeologists were Western European males, could that have been contamination? Stay tuned. Way back in 2007, people started working with DNA on the famous Queen Hatshepsut who was uh, a queen in her own right, very powerful woman, and she was possibly the woman who pulled Moses out of the Nile. At least in a historical context, she's right in about the right spot. Now, it was a pharaonic princess, and she was a pharaonic princess, who later became Pharaoh herself. We don't know if it was her, but it was someone in that era. And that just makes a very interesting uh, story of palace intrigue, as she has a stepson raised in the palace who is amongst a people group that her dad was trying to murder at the same time. Crazy, I don't know, but she's right there. Well, they had this old mummy that they had found in the 1800s, didn't have a label. It was just an unidentified female mummy. But then someone found a canopic jar. That's uh, the jar that they would store the internal organs in when they mummified, um, a, in this case, Hatshepsut. And her name was on the jar, and a liver was in the jar, and a tooth was in the jar. And they said, what? wait a minute, this tooth has a broken root, and this root matches uh, uh, the mummy that we found many years ago. Sorry, I had a fly in my ear. And I even had a broken tooth. So with the, the matched tooth and the name Hatshepsut on the jar, they said this is Hatshepsut's mummy. And they were able to pull some DNA out of it. And of course, you can't do that, they said. Other people said you can do it. This is early on, though. Later on, uh, a paper by Schwenemann et al., they looked at, I believe, 150 different mummies from a, about a 1,200-year span. This is in the Fayum district. It's a, a lake to the west of the Nile that they made in ancient times, and they diverted uh, the river into an old depression, and um, people still live there. It's a huge, productive place. There's lots of houses there. They, they fish a lot. There's a lot of farming in that area, but that's the Fayum. So they grabbed 150 mummies, and this spans from the New Kingdom era through the Ptolemaic Greek period, through the Roman period, and they pulled DNA out of, I believe, 90 of them, and they showed some amazingly cool things. First of all, the female lines, the mitochondria, came from all different branches of the mitochondrial family tree, because 
Over many years, the biblical pattern that was set up at the Tower of Babel got scrambled, as I explained in an earlier video. You can't look at people today, or even in ancient times, and say they came from Shem, they came from Ham, because of so much mixing in history. We see that in the female lineages. Uh, second, they showed that there was some gene flow from Nubia to the south into the north over time, and a little bit in the other direction. And they showed that there was a huge jump in sub-Saharan African DNA after the Muslim conquest of Egypt. So after there was a unified religion that spanned this great, great area from the north to the south, people could move up north, people could move south, and there was more mixing of DNA across the Sahara Desert. The Sahara is a massive uh, biogeographical barrier. There's not much gene flow across that. In history, there has not been much at all. Egyptians are much more similar to, I don't know, Syrians, to uh, the Western Asian people than they are to Sub-Saharan Africans. They're more similar to Europeans than they are to Sub-Saharan Africans. They're a very Mediterranean culture because of history. Now, I know the Bible says that two sons of Ham came to Egypt, put in Mizraim, well, not put, but Mizraim and puts next to Mizraim. But that signal should have been diluted over many, many thousands of years. As I explained earlier, go look at my earlier video if you want more information on that. But some people complained bitterly that Schoenemann's paper was flawed. They said their statistics are bad, their genetics isn't that great. And, okay, fine. But they still pulled DNA and they still saw all these, um, these mitochondrial lineages. Maybe they couldn't detect as accurately as they thought the gene flow or the barrier. That's an, a matter for the future. But we don't have a lot of ancient DNA from Egypt. This is changing, but not a lot. A few years before that, Zawi Hawass, who is the most famous Egyptologist in modern times, he's got his face on every Egypt documentary made, newspapers, uh, TV, he's all over the place. But he was the lead author on a paper on ancient DNA. Yeah, he was the lead author on a DNA paper. I don't know how he scored that, but he's super famous and he's there. He's working with his geneticists, and they looked at the DNA of Pharaoh Ramses III, who was famously murdered by one of his sons. Now, the sons became what they call the screaming mummy because they decided to get back at what he did to his father. He almost cut his father's head off, that they were going to embalm him alive. And he turns into the screaming mummy. I'm not going to show you pictures. It's gross. You can look it up online if you want to. But Hawass is the lead author on this article, and they determined that Ramses had haplogroup or group E1B1A, which is a very common African Y chromosome. Okay, so we have African pharaohs, African Y chromosomes, and we expect therefore that the Ramsed line, the lineage, would have E1B1A until you hit the Ptolemaic area, and then you get all sorts of different things happening. I mean, crazy things. Queen Cleopatra VII, the final Cleopatra, the one who had a romance with Mark Antony and with Julius Caesar and had children by them, well, she only had three, I believe, great-grandparents. You're supposed to have eight great-grandparents. She had three, indicating the shocking levels of inbreeding in that family. But this is also true back in earlier Egyptian history. King Tut married his sister. His father, the heretic pharaoh Akhenaten, married his sister. His father, Amenhotep III, married his sister. This is true way early in Egyptian history. Hatshepsut married her brother. Her brother also married another sister. He was the product of a brother-sister marriage. They were the product of a brother-sister marriage. Super amounts of inbreeding, and it's really kind of gross, and it probably led to destruction of that lineage because King Tut was mutant and we see it. He had a cleft palate. His father had a cleft palate. Uh, he had scoliosis. His father had scoliosis. A scoliosis higher up in that family tree also. The two stillborn children that they found in Tut's tomb that had been mummified were clearly deformed, probably because of all this inbreeding. A similar thing happened in Habsburg, Spain. King Carlos II, the last of Spanish Habsburgs, he couldn't even close his jaw. He was mentally incompetent. He, he, showed evidence of multiple things that had been floating around in that family. It all came together in one person. That was the end of the lineage. We also see things like this in, um, in Ireland. The famous New Grange Passage tomb in Ireland, they found an elite burial. And when they sequenced the DNA of that individual, 
looks like he's the product of a brother-sister marriage. So for centuries across the world, all different uh, leading families were inbreeding to keep the bloodline so-called pure, but they were also probably driving themselves extinct because inbreeding is stupid. But in 2021, Gad et al. Now Gad was a co-author with the earlier Zawi Hawass paper, but Gad et al. published a paper where they studied the DNA of King Tutankhamun's family. And this is really interesting because Tutankhamun had my Y chromosome. Now he predates Ramses by several generations, but he had my Y chromosome, R1B. It's the most common lineage in Western Europe. About 80% of Western European men have R1B. And so did Tutankhamun. And so did his father, Akhenaten. And so did his father, Amenhotep III. Where did that come into Egypt? Because R1B looks like it arose in Central Asia, north of the Black and Caspian Seas, and not 100,000 years ago, not even 50,000 years ago. Even in the evolutionary model, it's a young Y chromosome. In my creationist model, it's a really young Y chromosome. And somehow these people spread out. They went west into Europe, they went east and south into India, and they also came to Egypt. Fascinating. Later on, the lineage ended and E1B1A pops up in the Ramsid dynasty. Okay, fine, but there was R1B here for at least three generations. Now granted, we don't know a lot. We don't have a lot of DNA for these people, but I want them to pull more. They got the whole parade of pharaohs in the, uh, the Museum of Civilization where you're not allowed to photograph, but they're there. There's generation after generation after generation of pharaohs. Why don't they have DNA out of them yet? Ugh. Anyway, they're very protective of their mummies and granted they should be, so we just have to wait patiently. But let's talk about the matriarchal side of King Tut's family. All of the mummies that they looked at belong to haplogroup K. That's King Tutankhamun and his father and his mother and the grandmother. This is uh, Tia, Thuya, uh, Akhenaten, and Tutankhamun. They all had the same mitochondria. But the mitochondria is not passed through the father's line, it's passed through the mother's line. Well. They actually all interbred with the same matriarchal line because Akhenaten, yeah, he married Nefertiti, who is, I believe, his half-sister, but she's not the mother of Tutankhamun. The beautiful Nefertiti, no, it's another, far, another mummy. We don't know the name of this mummy. They called her the Younger Lady. Turns out her DNA was a match for Tutankhamun, but she was also Akhenaten's sister. Therefore, the mitochondria went from grandmother to mother to sister to son to Tutankhamun. They all had the same mitochondria. Again, this is due to inbreeding. So I'm going to leave you with that. I know that wasn't a very biblical explanation of Egypt on biblical genetics and supposed to be focusing on the Bible. There's more coming on the subject. I'm going to be filming more, but filming here has been incredibly difficult. This is the, no joke, fifth time I've filmed this episode. I had an issue with lighting. I tried in my room with too much light behind me. My auto exposure was going insane. I tried on this ship as it was moving up the Nile. The shot was awesome, but the noise from the engine overwhelmed my microphone. I tried uh, filming at the hotel in Cairo with this lovely golf course in the background, but I knocked out my, uh, my microphone cord halfway through. Um, even today, I've tried three times this morning, but for some strange reason, my camera has fallen out of its mount and crashed to the ground. I had to restart three times. I don't know, is this the curse of the Pharaoh? No, I think it's just me being an inept filmmaker. I'm trying, I'm trying really hard. I'm trying to bring things to you that can bless you, that can help you, that can encourage you. Christian, there is really amazing things that supports the Bible. I know the skeptics are out there pounding us on the head. I know they're ridiculing us. I know they're calling us stupid and ridiculous and, e and idiotic, but it's not true. We have a book that the creator of this universe gave us. The book is history. The book is accurate. The book actually is true. And genetics is backing that up in many ways. But this episode, not so much because I want to describe ancient Egypt and ancient DNA. And I didn't talk about historical events because it's, those aren't genetic events necessarily. But I've talked a lot about other things that do tie into the Bible here in the show. And I've got some more Egyptian episodes coming up. Now, I don't know if I'm going to have time to film before I go home. I mean, I'm filming here at sunrise. I got up early to film this because I have a busy day. We are going to, um, oh boy, we're going to Karnak Temple. We're going to Luxor Temple. We're going to go to a papyrus factory. 
Uh, yesterday we went to um, Queen Hatshepsut Memorial uh, um, Temple, which is the most beautiful thing in this country. We went to the Valley of the Kings. We saw King Tutankhamun's tomb and other tombs. Uh, we went to the, um, the Colossi of Memnon, which has nothing to do with Memnon. That's a Greek name. It's one of the, one of the Egyptian pharaohs, massive statues. We've been to museums. We've driven across the Sahara Desert. We have uh, boated on the Nile. We've done all these amazing things. I'm sorry if you missed it, but here's a little bit of Egypt by proxy. Maybe you'd like to come on one of CMI's future tours. Just stay tuned to our website. Sign up to our email newsletter. Go to creation.com and just click on the I want to sign up for info bites and we'll keep you up to date on these things. Maybe you want to subscribe to my Biblical Genetics YouTube channel. Just click the little subscribe button. Give it a like. I'd really appreciate that. If you'd like to support Biblical Genetics, this is not something that CMI is paying for. I'm doing this on my own time, best I can. I'm kind of piggybacking on my travels because it just makes for interesting backgrounds and interesting conversation. But if you'd like to help support my efforts here, uh, you go to patreon.com, search for Biblical Genetics. Those are my long-term supporters. Or buymeacoffee.com, search for Biblical Genetics. Now buymeacoffee.com, that's like, I think it's $3, $6 or $9 or something like that. It's just, hey Carter, I like your work. Here's a little tip, buy yourself a coffee. I'd appreciate it. Um, those links are also in the show notes and on my, my website, biblicalgenetics.com.